Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Shane Patel. I'm a consultant orthopaedic surgeon at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. Uh, this evening, I'd like to introduce Andrew Adair, who is a consultant orthopaedic foot and ankle surgeon at the Ulster Hospital in Musgrave Hospital for the past 14 years. He's the lead clinician for trauma and orthopaedics at the Ulster Hospital and undertook his foot and ankle fellowship in Melbourne in 2006. He's a keen rugby and golfer, uh, sorry, keen rugby and golfer, uh, keen rugby player and golfer, and the foot and ankle specialist at Ulster Rugby. Um, I'd just like to tell you the feedback code for today is 1388A15 in case you need to get your feedback forms. And while I look forward to, well, I anticipate it will be a great talk by Andrew on rheumatoid forefoot and lesser toe deformities. Andrew, I'd like to uh, ask, invite you to share your screen um, and uh, start uh, your excellent webinar. Thank you, uh, Shillian, and uh, everybody, you're very welcome to Belfast uh, in Northern Ireland. Andrew, uh, could I just ask you to sh start your video, please, because we can't see you. Apologies. Thank you. There we are. Are you happy now? Yes, that's great, thank you. Great, sorry about that, Joe. Well, everybody, um, welcome to Belfast in Northern Ireland to the third lecture in this series of uh, put together by BOFAS. And tonight's lecture is on lesser toe conditions and the rheumatoid forefoot. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. And the objectives for this evening's talk are uh, to discuss lesser two conditions, the nomenclature and definition, treatment options, MTB instability, the bunionette, intractable plantar keratosis, and then move on to the rheumatoid forefoot. So we'll start with lesser two conditions and the definitions. Uh, a hammer two, I would describe as a deformity of the MTP joint, which would involve extension or dorsiflexion at the MTP joint, flexion at the PIP joint, and either a neutral or slightly extended DIP joint. A claw toe would have extension at the MTP joint and flexion of both the PIP and the DIP joint. A mallet toe would have neutral MTP, PIP joint, and a flexed DIP joint. And then we have the curly toe, which is really just a, a very gentle curvature along the length of the toe. Now, when we come to assessment, uh, in particular, um, concentrating on the toe, quite often when you have a fixed flexion or a flexion deformity at the DIP joint, you will find a rather small, atrophic, thick, nail and tip callus, which is often prone to break down. As we get into the sort of the, 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 the flexion of the PIP joint and extension at the MTP joint, we see evidence of callus formation, rubbing, thinning of the skin over the PIP joint. And at the MTP joint, often a fullness. And indeed, when we're assessing the joint, a tenderness. As the toe becomes uh, more extended at the MTP joint, the pressure during the gait cycle tends to push the MTP head more plantarwards, causing pressure. And then we get this either a discrete callus beneath the seconds or really a more diffuse callus beneath generalized the lesser MTP joints. During the assessment, really, can we work out what is the cause of the toe deformity? Is it a neurological condition? So it may be a, uh, a, a Charcot-Marie tooth where there's weakness of the intrinsic muscles of the foot, imbalance with the long muscles of the foot. It could be rheumatological, whereby we have inflammation and destruction and weakening of the MTP joint, allowing for uh, the deformity at that level. 
Is it a malformation syndrome? Is there possibly a, a, a delta phalanx causing a deformity? And has there been trauma to the foot to result in the deformity? Is this a high risk too? Is this a high risk too of infection? Is it high risk of complications after surgery? And really, is there signs of acute infection during your examination? During the history taking, it's often very nice to ask, has the patient been provided with antibiotics by the general practitioner, suggesting there has been superficial or possibly deep infection in the past? I'd like to assess the vascular status of the foot in general. Now, obviously that's very simple. In the consulting room, we can measure pulses, but that's not very helpful when we come to think about skin healing, and especially as we move distally in the toe. So we, one, one tries to get a broad picture of the, the, the quality of the skin and whether the skin is capable of healing. Are these patients diabetic? So there'll be peripheral neuropathy, loss of protective session, sensation. Are they at risk of further rubbing during a post-operative period? And is this too stiff? Again, a stiff toe more likely to rub and cause ulceration. Now, obviously we want to manage as many foot conditions as we can non-operatively. And we have found that a flexible toe deformity is much more easy to manage conservatively than one that is fixed. We should be in a position to give advice on footwear. We should be in a position to advise patients on their shoe size. And sometimes it's very nice to draw the shape of the foot and the shape of the and superimpose that with a tracing of the shoe uh, to demonstrate that the shoe is inappropriate. We need to ensure that they've got deep wide toe box, toe, toe box shoes to accommodate the deformity and give advice that many cobblers, local cobblers are perfectly capable of stretching toes and accommodating or stretching leathers to accommodate toe deformities. In our consulting rooms, we often have metatarsal pads and supports toe pads and props and toe sleeves, which we can provide to the patient there and then. Now, many patients will quite happily wear such toe spacers or toe uh, supports, but many other patients are intolerant of such. When we think about operative management of toe deformities, really we, the patient has to have realistic expectations. We are Trading off a deformed toe often, which is flexed at the PIP joint, or a straighter toe, which is less painful, but lacks some movement, is often shorter and is often more swollen. So the patient has to really be happy to trade off the deformity for a slightly straighter toe, which is less painful. Now, when we look at the operative management of a flexible hammer or claw to. We look at the Girdlestone Taylor flexor extensor uh, procedure. And this is a tra transfer of the long flexor tendons of the toes to the dorsal expansion of the extensor mechanism. And in theory is meant to give a dynamic correction to the toe. So you can see in this diagram that the flexor digitorum longus is incised transferred from the plantar to the dorsal aspect of the, uh, of the toe and sutured to the extensor mechanism. I find in, when doing this that I, I prefer a, a longer longitudinal incision along the dorsal aspect of the toe. And that gives me much greater access to both the medial and lateral aspects of the toe in order to uh, secure the flexor tendon. It is a reasonably good satisfaction result, but it tends to leave the toe stiff, and I find tends to leave the toe rather full looking and swollen. When we look at the hammer or claw toe, where there's a fixed PIP joint, we would need to give consideration to a PIP joint fusion or excisional arthroplasty, whereby the condyles, the distal aspect of the proximal phalanx is excised. In the picture on the left, there's been an a elliptical 
incision over the PIP joint. And I find that allows you to use the uh, dorsal capsule to help control the position of the toe. When performing an arthroplasty, I would prefer to perform two flat cuts, reduce the toe, and then secure that with a K wire to the level of the MTP joint. And obviously, nowadays, there are, there are more modern implants available, such as the smart toe, uh, which is an internal uh, device to secure the PIP or DIP joint. Again, when we look at the results, whether it be arthroplasty or fusion, there's really no great difference in the outcome and uh, satisfaction results are reasonably high. But of course, as we've discussed, there are issues with stiffness. There are issues with DIP joint instability due to the uh, added pressures at that joint. Issues with malalignment, malunion and numbness. And as I said, these newer fixation devices, although they are very expensive and often awkward to use, don't seem to improve the results or reduce the complication rate as compared to a very cheap K wire. When we consider the hammer toe in conjunction with deformity at the MTP joint and whether we have a fixed PIB joint and MTP joint, we need to add in a soft tissue release at the MTP joint. And the soft tissue release really involves considering the tendons, so an extensor tendon lengthening, extensor digitorum brevis tenotomy, release the collaterals, release the plantar structures. Often the plantar plate is degenerate and atrophic, but release under the plantar aspect of the metatarsal head. And then again, K-wire fixation across the MTP joint to secure the toe in the desired position. And as, again, as we see, satisfaction results are reasonable. Now we consider a mallet toe with flexion deformity at the DIP joint, and that treatment will involve flexor digitorum longus tenotomy and either excision arthroplasty or a DIP fusion. One of the issues with this operation is it leaves the toe rather swollen at the end and it does take some time to settle down. We're in and around the nail bed and there can be issues with nail growth. When we consider a curly toe in a child, we would uh, try and correct the toe with a flexor tenotomy and possibly K-wire fixation. And in an adult, this would require a corrective DIP fusion. And as we've discussed, the patient needs to be aware of complications which will involve infection, numbness, recurrence of the deformity, a mal or non-union. Sometimes we get bony prominences on either side, medial and lateral, which rub on the toe. The toe can stay painful. There is a neurovascular risk and a risk of amputation, although very low. So in summary, when we consider the treatment of a lesser toe deformity, where is the problem? Is it mostly soft tissue and therefore flexible or is there a fixed bony component? With a mallet toe which is flexible, you need to consider FDL tenotomy, plus or minus wiring in the position and possibly a DAP fusion. This is a great way of uh, ad addressing a, a toe which is rather long, especially in ladies and it interferes with their footwear. When the mallet toe deformity is fixed, perform a DIP fusion or a proximal middle phalanx condylectomy. When looking at hammer toe, when the deformity is flexible, we think of a flexor to extensor transfer, accepting that there'll be a stiff swollen toe. When the deformity is fixed, a PIP fusion or arthroplasty, K wire, soft tissue release, but again, consideration of malalignment and recurrence. When we have a claw too, again, when it's flexible, a flexor to extensor transfer, soft tissue release of the MTP joint, and when fixed, 
a PIP fusion or arthroplasty, KWAR fixation, a soft tissue release, and a metatarsal osteotomy if required. Metatarsal osteotomy being a, a Viles osteotomy, a shortening decompression osteotomy to reduce the joint. A soft tissue release uh, would involve stepwise consideration of extensor digitorum brevis release, extensor digitorum lengthening, release of the MTP capsule and collaterals, release of the plantar structures, and possibly then combined with K wire fixation. Now, many of these toe deformities are associated with metatarsophalangeal joint instability. And this occurs if there's being progressive degenerative plantar plate, collateral ligament degeneration and tearing. A biplanar MTB instability where by you have hallux valgus deformity, there's overload onto the second MTP joint. You get failure with dorsiflexion at the MTP, extension at the MTP joint and possibly collateral ligament uh, insufficiency and virus valgus deformity. A congenitally long second metatarsal will place added stresses on the MTP joint and lead to its failure. An inflammatory arthritis, you get inflammation of the side of itis of the joint with weakening of the supporting structures and deformity at the MTP joint. Or in a chronic hammer two deformity, the increased pressures during the gait cycle will lead to progressive weakening of the MTP structures. And again, as a hallux valgus progresses, we see dislocation of the MTP joint on osteoarthritis. So during assessment of the MTP joint, the pain can be rather diffuse. Uh, with a severe hallux valgus, you'll find that the second and third MTP joints are stressed, they're overloaded, they're both inflamed, and so you get a rather diffuse pain. I often find that the pain is more noticeable on the dorsal aspect of the two. Um, you can, the prominence, you can appreciate the prominence of the metatarsal head, and hence the patient's description of walking on a pebble. But often the, the pain is localized to one MTP joint and possibly the PIP joint in a hammer too. This picture depicts the Lachman's test, which is very useful for two reasons. One, during the test, the joint may be stable, but it does localize the pain to the MTP joint and is very useful in localizing the pain to the MTP joint and excluding other forfeit pathologies, which may be causing metatarsalgia. And also the Lachman test, as with other joints, reveals joint instability. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, with regards to imaging at the MTP joint, obviously we um, weight bearing AP lateral oblique x rays, sesamoid views can be helpful. And then when we move on, uh, an MRI scan or an ultrasound scan. And that largely depends on uh, your relationship with your radiologist. Um, I must admit, I'm very uh, in favor of ultrasound scanning for uh, isolated MTP issues, but if the, if the diagnosis isn't so clear, I would um, certainly order an MRI scan when looking for a combination of pathologies. Now again, with any toe deformity, we'll look at the conservative treatment of analgesia, a custom orthotic. Uh, this is often associated with ankle hind foot deformity, so we may need to incorporate post heel posting, arch supports, uh, metatarsal domes to offload the MTP joints, taping of the toes to reduce the toe and offload the pressure from the MTP joint, and possibly injection therapy. Uh, understanding that injection of steroid into a joint will weaken the supporting structures and possibly unmask or accelerate a toe deformity. Now, operative management of an MTP joint I, in a stepway, in, in a stepway, in, a, in, a, in a, a manner in which I address both the soft tissues and bony structures in a stepway progression, I often perform a PIP arthroplasty or fusion, then address the MTP joint. So that would be soft tissue release of the extensor tendons and extensor digitorum brevis tenotomy and extensor digitorum longus lengthening, release of the MTP capsule, 
release of the collaterals. If it's appropriate, a planter plate repair. And certainly planter plate repair is becoming more popular in the acute setting. But I do feel it does need to be limited to the acute setting in the, uh, in the more degenerate long-term two deformities, I find the planter plate is rather atrophic and it's difficult to repair. But you can see on the arthroscopic pictures on the left, the metatarsal head, the base of the proximal phalanx and the planter plate, which has to be secured to the undersurface of the um, metatarsal phalangeal joint. And quite often with a um, unstable, fixed or degenerate MTP joint, we would need to give consideration to a vial osteotomy to shorten, decompress the joint to reduce the, uh, to reduce the toe. And often uh, when you're starting off with plantar plate repairs, a vial osteotomy is required to gain access. And again, the satisfaction rate in this type of procedure, slightly less than in a single hammer toe deformity, but again, reasonably acceptable with an improvement in pain profile. Now in the dislocated toe with a poor MTP joint, a Stainsby procedure can be considered. And the Stainsby procedure involves dividing the extensor tendons proximal to the MTP joint excision of proximal two thirds of the proximal phalanx release of the plantar structures and as I said before often the plantar structures are atrophic but we release the fat pad and any other uh, sclerotic lesion there The flexor tendon and extensor tendon are sutured together, the two reduced and K wired. And again, this produces reasonable results. But again, as the deformity becomes more uh, advanced, satisfaction rates tend to reduce. And here's an example of the severe hallux valgus overriding second toes, arthritic joints, and undergone. A reasonably successful correction of the hallux valgus, Stainsby's procedures with a very quiet plantar surface of the foot. Excuse me. Now a bunionette or Taylor's bunion, prominence of the fifth metatarsal head, either as a exostosis of the head or unmasking of the MTP joint with medial drift of the, the, of the fifth toe. It causes symptomatic prominence. A small toe box shoe exacerbates this by pushing the fifth toe over. Hallux valgus, there's widening of the forefoot, which increases the pressure and produces uh, a symmetrical deformity. Hallux valgus and varus deformity of the little toe. There's often a bursa and swelling, which adds to the, 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 the swelling and uh, pressure. Skin problems. I've often found the lateral digital nerve is in close proximity and patients are, can often get quite a, a high level of pain with a minimal deformity. And again, inflammatory arthritis with destruction and instability of the joint. Once again, non-operative management, shoes that fit, very difficult to pad the toe, but little pads may be appropriate. And an op operative wise ex excision of the prominence and an osteotomy. And there are many different osteotomies which have been described. I find the chevron osteotomy without internal fixation is my go-to operation that allows excision of the prominence. A, a properly performed chevron osteotomy is stable and the patient can wait there. And again, it produces very nice results. Now, an intractable plantar keratosis, callus beneath the metatarsal heads, 
the increased mechanical pressure causes an increase in the keratinocyte activity. And patients will clearly describe attending their podiatrist. They address the hard skin. They feel great for a day or two, but it's back after a couple of weeks. Diffuse callus or diffuse IPK is in response to shearing or pressure by the entire metatarsal hyoid, while a discrete IPK or corn is usually due to a prominence in the fibular condyle of the metatarsal head. Non-surgical manage will involve simple skin procedures of scalpel, pumice stone, padding, offloading, insoles, and often gastrocnemia stretching in an attempt to offload the forefoot. Surgical management really to address mechanical factors. And these may include issues with the first MTP joint, reduced dorsiflexion. There's then a transfer load to the second MTP joint, et cetera. Address any toe deformity, address any gastroc soleus contracture, and then resect the prominent condyle. So, That brings us on to rheumatoid forefoot, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, a systemic disease, really an, an immune mediated inflammatory disease. It's auto perpetuating, um, a chronic systemic disease affecting all synovial joints, women more affected than men, affecting up to 1% in the Western world. Age of presentation is in the fourth decade, two to 3% of our population over 55 maybe develop rheumatoid arthritis. Very important during your history and examination to appreciate that this is a systemic disease which can affect many other organs in the body. Fortunately, in modern medicine in the UK, the diagnosis is usually established before the patient arrives with the orthopedic surgeon, but this is not always the case. And we should be mindful that 17% 17 per, 17 of cases present with forfeit issues. This is a systemic disease and requires a multidisciplinary team, which will involve physiotherapy, occupational therapy, podiatry, rheumatologists, rheumatological nurses, and other orthopedic surgeons. We've moved a long way in the management of rheumatoid arthritis. When I was starting, it was paracetamol, paracodol, anti-inflammatory medications. And then this analgesic triangle was flipped on its head and we start with disease modifying medication. And really they are just moving on. Every time I, I open a new book, there's another uh, drug on the market. There's another uh, advance in where the, uh, this cascade is being attacked. But these TNF suppressing inflammatory, um, the, the drugs that suppress inflammatory process have dramatically altered uh, the, the management and the presentation of rheumatoid arthritis. It's important to take a, a, a good history. Uh, I would also always, with any foot and ankle patients, start off with their age, their occupation and their hobbies. This gives me a, a fair idea of what sort of patient we're dealing with and what their demands and expectations are going to be. Uh, if, there, if there's no obvious diagnosis, then it's important to ask family history, other joint issues, what treatment they've had, how long they've been on it. It's important to know how they react when they stop their steroids or methotrexate or disease, other disease modifying uh, medications. What's their relationship with the rheumatological team? What joints are affected? Uh, have they had previous surgery? How have they healed following the previous surgery? Have they had issues with wound healing? Um, are there other disease process? Rheumatoid patients can present with diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, et cetera, which all will impact on our uh, outcomes from surgery. Um, other social factors, how are they going to manage in the post-operative period? Will they need additional help? I wish to know what medication they're on, so particularly steroids, methotrexate, TNF inhibitors.
during the examination, uh, how do they present? How do they come through the room? What's their gait like? What's their mobility like? Are they using a stick? What footwear do they have? What are their hands and upper limbs like? Are they going to be able to support crutches? Are they going to need additional OT measures? Um, it's, I like to assess the, the, the alignment of the lower limb. What knee, ankle, hind foot issues do they have? Are these deformities fixed? What is the skin like? Is it atrophic? Is there signs of uh, infection? What's the vascular status like? So, and then with the forefoot, are the deformities fixed, flexible? What is the callus, the fat pad? And then like examine the shoes and what insoles they have. And really very important, what is the patient's expectation of me? When we consider the disease modifying drugs and surgery, I am very comfortable allowing patients to stay on their steroids and methotrexate. I haven't had any great issues or I don't think there are great issues with allowing them to maintain this medication. Um, I would ask how they respond if they stop their steroids or methotrexate. If they have no issues, then uh, it's reasonable to stop them. But often you'll find they have a, a rheumatological flare and then I'm very happy that they stay on it. With, re with regards to the biological therapies, we have to balance the risk of infection or delayed healing against the rheumat rheumatological flare. It would be advisable to stop drugs of this type, three to five half-lives before surgery and don't restart until the wound's healed. But it does, and I would believe that as, as years passed, the evidence on biologics and wound, wound healing would suggest there's minimal risk. So how does rheumatoid affect the forefoot? Well, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammation of the synovium, which causes proliferation, uh, panis, the inflamed over exuberant uh, synovium, which destroys, which causes periarticular erosions and reduces the stability of joint. Inflammation, synovitis, distension of the joint capsule, destruction of the ligaments and cartilage. The force producing dorsiflexion during the gait cycle leads to subluxation of the MTP joint and ultimately dislocation of the MTP joint. And all those factors result in the clinical, classical clinical deformity of splaying of the forefoot, hallux valgus or hallux rigidus, clawing and hammering for lesser toes, metatarsalgia, secondary to plantar callosities, distal migration of the protective fat pad and fragile atrophic skin. And all this causes pain and difficulty with footwear. So again, management of any foot condition should be commenced with non-operative. And often we'll find out that the, the feet may not be the problem and that the shoes may just need to be changed. And often there are many different varieties of footwear modification. Custom shoes should have extra width, extra depth, extra depth and be able to accommodate a functional foot orthoses. They really are not the most pleasant aesthetic piece of footwear and you can quite quickly judge your patient and determine whether they would ever consider using a custom shoe. Because surgery should only be considered following failure of conservative treatment or a patient who's not willing to wear custom shoes. How has the approach to rheumatoid forfeit surgery progressed? Well, in 1912, Hoffman described excision of the prominent metatarsal heads through a plantar incision. Fowler in 57 described a dorsal incision to the forefoot to remove the proximal halves of the proximal phalanges and trim the metatarsal, prominent metatarsal heads. In 1967, a modified Hoffman's with excision of the ellipse of plantar skin in an attempt to relocate the dislocated fat pad and excision of the metatarsal heads. And this was commonly known as the forefoot arthroplasty. But the importance of the first metatarsal and stability of the first metatarsal wasn't recognized till much later in 84, 
when Mann and Thompson proposed Arthur's thesis of the first MTP joint in combination with their section of the lesser marked tarsal heads. And for what are considered severe and destructive deformities, described very good results. And here we see the plantar incision, a cascade across the metatarsal heads. And you will find that the more severe the deformity, the easier this procedure is, as the metatarsal heads basically just pop through the skin. It's important to consider the cascade and to ensure that there are no bony prominences. And again, on the right, we've had excision of metatarsal heads and a first MPP arthrodesis. Again, another clinical picture um, of a, a more stable construct of a first MTP arthrodesis associated with resection of the lesser metatarsal heads and K wiring of the toes. Often PIP arthrodesis to correct hammer toes or a simple closed osteoclasis of the toes and K wiring is sufficient. However, forefoot arthroplasty is less commonly performed. It is technically challenging procedure to address the cascade and prevent any abnormal pressure load following the surgery. But I think it has become less common because of our management of rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, it is a changing disease with regards to foot deformity. Not only are we, I just don't see the rheumatoid arthritis, the mutilans type uh, picture uh, as often. And really we have now moved to joint conserving surgery in rheumatoid arthritis. We see the patients early, the joints aren't destroyed, they are potentially salvageable. And we will consider metatarsal osteotomies to realign hallux valgus, maintain the metatarsals, but perform metatarsal osteotomies to reduce the pressure uh, of the MTP joints and reduce the joints. And indeed, it's moved on even more to minimally invasive surgery, uh, which again respects the soft tissue and allows percutaneous metatarsal osteotomies. And again, here we have an example of uh, percutaneous lesser metatarsal osteotomies. And again, with respect to the soft tissues, wound healing is, uh, is very good. And really these metatarsal osteotomies don't require any internal fixation. And again, we have some clinical examples of minimally invasive metatarsal osteotomies, tiny wound incisions, uh, which heal very well and give very nice correction of the toes. Um, a clinical example here, uh, one of my own cases, an 80 year old lady, advanced rheumatoid arthritis, severe hallux valgus, dislocation of the lesser MTP joints. Some MTP joints well, lesser MTP joints well preserved, others showing signs of uh, destruction. And she was boarded for forefoot arthroplasty for the first MTP fusion, resection of the lesser metatarsal heads, trying to maintain a nice cascade across the metatarsals. Uh, her fourth toe in this uh, foot was uh, amputated because she had previous issues and uh, it really wasn't viable. But on the left side, I put this slide in because I wanted to mirror the procedure on the right side with the first MTP fusion and plate fixation. But by the time we'd resected the lesser metatarsal heads, plate fixation had given way. And this just reflects the degree of osteoporosis. And an 80 year old lady, rheumatoid arthritis for many, many years, taking steroids and other uh, medication. And the bone is just so fragile. And this is a very good salvage procedure if you get yourself into trouble in the MTP joint, multiple K wires threaded or smooth into the joint and that maintains the joint. And this lady, it fused and she was very happy. Now I don't have uh, post-operative pictures because I'm not one to take pictures if the toe's resting in a functional position and it is stable. But that, if you put that in your memory banks, it's a lovely way of getting yourself out of a bit of trouble. So in summary, um, hopefully 
you can take away with your tonight a clear definition of lesser two deformities, how to describe them, and how to manage a tailored treatment program. Rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic disease involving a multidisciplinary team. The modern rheumatoid patient has expectations which can be challenging, and that reflects that their deformities are not as severe and the foot allows them to perform to a much higher level than was previously the case. A careful consideration of non-operative versus operative treatment. Think about systemic medication and think about stable, stabilizing the first ray and joint preservation surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That was a, a fantastic talk. Um, we do have some questions uh, in the audience. Um, is it okay to, to run through them with you? Or do you need a quick glass? Lovely. Okay. So one of the questions we had was about the role of uh, implants in terms of uh, PIP joint fusion. You mentioned in your slides that you prefer to use KYs, but then you showed us a picture of the smart toes. Where do you think the role of these implants is? Do you think that they're actually quite dangerous to use in terms of then thinking about revision, or do you think that they have a place? Uh, I think they have a place. Um, it is a much more challenging uh, technique. Uh, they do take a little bit of time to get used to. Um, th their advantage, there is no difference to the um, skin incision. Uh, the advantage is that the foot is possibly uh, into a shoe several weeks earlier. Although I do find that some ladies or gentlemen are very adaptive and get their, even with a K wire at the end of the toe, they get it into a shoe or a boot. Um, so potentially uh, the toe is a little bit more stable. So the swelling might be a little re more reduced, but they're very expensive. And for the price of a K wire, uh, I only use a smart toe in institutions outside the NHS. Um. We had another question, which is, what do you think the role is of um, things like silastic spacers or cartiva replacements when the big toe uh, MTP joint is arthritic in a rheumatoid and they don't necessarily have a big deformity? Do you think we still need to proceed with fusion there or could we get away with some sort of arthroplasty to keep the movement? Well, I, th I, I think as, uh, as we move on, there is just a great desire for joint preserving um, surgery. Um, I, I suppose I will wait to see the long-term studies about how good Cartiva silicone implants are in the first MTB joint in a patient who doesn't have rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory arthritis. My fear would be that uh, the joint is being preserved, so there still is the synovium, there still will be most likely progression of the disease. And then we've got a, an implant which is prone to degrade anyway inside a joint and give rights to further synovitis. So, um, yeah, um, it is. Well, well, I think that was to be, we'll, we'll wait and see, okay. but I, I don't think I would be doing it. Okay. And um, we've got, obviously, so you, you, you mentioned rheumatoid uh, medications have really changed the way rheumatoid disease is managed nowadays. And one of the things that we don't see anymore is the inflamed synovium around the tip post tendon and then just debriding it and releasing all the synovium out to prevent further problems. But obviously we do see patients with tip post dysfunction who happen to have rheumatoid arthritis. Um, do, you, do you think that within these sorts of patients who are then prone to getting joint problems that we should be still going with a flexible kind of correction, you know, calcaneal osteotomy, tendon transfer, or do you think it's safer to go with uh, proceeding to either a double or a triple fusion in the in the in the symptomatic tip post patients who happen yeah. to have rheumatoid? Um, I think I would again to take forefoot principles, joint preserving, maintain motion. I would be reasonably comfortable in offering in the younger, more athletic, high demand patient a tip post reconstruction. And um, we have one or two last questions on uh, the rheumatoid, which has obviously been a, a fascinating um, area of interest for a lot of the, uh, the viewers, which is, 
what when you're approaching the metatarsal heads and you're approaching them dorsally do you tend to approach two and three and four and five with separate in, as, as in two a two incision kind of approach or do you tend to approach the metatarsal heads each individually so one incision per per metatarsal no i would um i would use two incisions mm -hmm. And um, so in that sort of forefoot, I would use a medial incision for my MTP approach. Yep. Uh, whereas normally I would usually be dorsal to the first MTP joint. I would then have a suitable incision in the second and uh, second web space to approach the second and third. And then in the uh, fourth web space to approach the fourth and fifth MTP joints. Okay. And, and the very final question is, in a rheumatoid uh, patient, what is your what? Is, what would you offer a patient? Would you offer them a stains B? Would you, I, I, uh, you know, proximal phalangectomy um, and uh, putting the, the tendon down into this space, or do you offer them a Fowler's, or do you do a metatarsal head excision and a proximal hemiphalangectomy? What is your personal preference? My my, my personal choice would be um, extensive soft tissue release and MTP, um, or a, excuse me, a metatarsal osteotomy. So a, okay. sort of a Wilds type osteotomy and hopefully decompress it that way. Right, lovely. Well, Andrew, that's been uh, fantastic. And that kind of brings our session to a close.